Hello everybody, it's Kevin here again, and this week we're going to be going over some items regarding documentation, chat GPT, uh, state, state management and Flutter, uh, the widget tree, widgets, and uh, some of the related items. So to begin, go ahead and create a new uh, project if you want to follow along with the video here. So at the very high level, uh, we have two different types of widgets and uh, at an even higher level we have what's known as uh, the widget tree. So the widget tree is what the entire application consists of, all of, the, all of the visual elements on the screen. So this here button is part of the, the widget tree, this here text widget is part of the widget tree. All of these items on screen are part of the widget tree. And then we have two different types of widgets. We have stateless and stateful widgets. So basically what uh, the, d the difference between the two is a stateless widget will uh, have data that won't change. So it'll, it'll be rendered once on screen, but it won't be able to change itself. Whereas a stateful widget will be able to change. It'll be able to have that data change. So what that means in layman's terms basically is if you have a stateful widget that's connected to a visual item on screen that visual item can change. Uh, you might be thinking why is it then late, later on maybe at this point you haven't really done a whole lot of flutter development quite yet but at a later point you might be thinking why is it that uh, this text this text changes for example right here one two right so why is this changing well it's attached to a variable and that variable is being changed in the set state in the set state function here so again not this this uh, state change isn't actually initiated by the text it's initiated by something else uh, you may also be thinking why not have all stateful widgets so why not have that capability with all of them the, re the reason is because they consume more memory so we don't want to consume too much memory it's going to lead to a slower application especially on older devices or devices that have uh, memory uh, bottlenecks basically so the widget tree like I said is essentially a tree we have the trunk in this case the trunk I mean really it's the main class that the widget is so this is everything's a widget right so this class is a widget that's going to be rendered on the screen and this scaffold is another widget and this scaffold takes in a parameter app bar that's also another widget so as you may be able to tell it just keeps on going and going and going so think of it as literally a tree you have a trunk at the bottom a, re a thick trunk and then it goes and starts branching off so the center might have and actually the center is not a good example here this uh, column is a good example because the column has uh, children of a list of widgets so you can have multiple multiple widgets inside of the column however with uh, like the scaffold you only have this main widget and the app bar well I guess the body is the main widget right so I guess this one isn't actually a very good example but like the center has a child column widget but it may have other properties so something that is quite useful is if you go and hit enter here it actually this won't that's because we define the child right here Let's see if column so the tooling basically so the tooling gives you uh, all the options that you can have for a certain parameter or uh, any of those related items so like for colors if you want to create a color you just use your tooling this is known as a tooling so start typing and then you'll get a whole bunch of options so you got to really get used to the tooling with this or else you're gonna fall on your face when it comes to this development especially with flutter so notice here how I made a change and then I saved so I just did control s so let me make a change to here this many times save and there we go it immediately reloads so this is quite useful I as I've mentioned before I work with uh, Xamarin every day and Xamarin does have this but uh, the fact that the logic both the logic and the UI are combined here makes it a little bit better because at least with Xamarin and it's replaced by Maui Maui is the current framework that you want to be using but 
with the legacy product Xamarin's what I'm using basically for the mobile app that I work on with uh, Xamarin you can't do at least the version that I'm on you can't do uh, logic changes the hot reload for the logic changes whereas with this we can go ahead and add uh, and I know none of this makes sense quite yet but we'll get into that so counter plus equals 10 save that notice that logic changes instantaneously very useful stuff it's a lot it leads to it leads to rapid application development of course there's the drawbacks and there's the benefits uh, benefit obviously rapid application development drawbacks <clears throat> if Apple makes some changes to their um, to one of their toolkits or to one of their API's anything like that it's gonna take some time for the flutter developers or the people that work on the flutter project to adapt it so that you can use those features in flutter so that's a pretty big drawback if you want to do a whole bunch of native stuff however uh, luckily most of the most if not all of the main stuff that you're gonna need uh, so basically displaying elements on screen making API calls just the create read update del uh, delete operations crud you can do all of that within Flutter and with Z within Xamarin and within React Native and uh, you can access some of the low-level system things like local storage and uh, file storage and other related items uh, and secure storage of, of course um, but in this case it's 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 more than enough. So if a company comes to you and says, "Hey, I'd like you know an application that has these specifications, so that I can..." So for example, my customer can go. My customers can uh, order stuff for my store, and they already have a, an API that's created, and this API serves uh, data to a website or a web application. Well, you can just call that same API with Flutter or with React Native, so on and so forth. So for those items, Flutter is phenomenal. It's uh, rapid application development, like I said, and it's pretty convenient. So let's start off with how we format. So first you return a scaffold. That's typically how widgets are set up. Now you can have other types of widgets. You can create other widgets, and we'll get, uh, we'll get um, into that at a later point. But at least for the main app, it's going to have a scaffold. And ideally, you're going to set a, uh, an app bar. Notice how right here, background color, we use a theme. So like I said, we'll get into these things later in the semester, but you can assign a background color to the app bar and other related items. And this makes it nice for consistency because once you set the theme globally, then you can just call that instance and then just pass in the context, of course, so that it gets all the necessary all of the necessary stuff so that I can return the correct items. So the correct color, the correct font sizes, the correct uh, fonts, so on and so forth. And then our title, of course, we have, this is another parameter, it's a text widget. So this brings us to our first widget that we're gonna be really working with this week, and it's the text widget. So this text widget can take in several parameters. First parameter is the text. So here, if we change it to week three lecture, Go ahead and save that. It uh, updates instantaneously there. Then, if we notice here in our scaffold, it has a body property, and this body property contains what's known as a center. The center does exactly what it sounds like. It centers the uh, visual elements inside of the widget. So the center is, has just a child, so this is another very important item. Some widgets have ch uh, just a single child. Other widgets have a list of widgets known as children. So the child, the, the important thing there is that child is just one widget that you can pass, that you can um, set, whereas children you can set multiple. So think about it logically, you have a center, some visual element in the, in the widget tree that uh, is going to be rendered on the screen. So this center only has one item. Now this one item can be rows, it can be buttons, it can be form fields, so on and so forth, but in this case it's just going to be a column and this column has children so now this is one that has multiple items it sounds pretty straightforward because a column like with database you can have multiple columns you can have multiple rows so and they they carry out exactly the same as they would with database we'll get into the alignments later on but 
this is something that you can also change now like I said your tooling is phenomenal so just do a dot and there you go you get multiple options you can also hover over and you can get some documentation here which we'll get into a little bit more with the documentation later on but very useful stuff get used to it because like I said it'll it'll make you uh, it'll help you get, work on these applications faster and get working code out faster so we're just gonna have this be in the center save and have it update so really like I'll just create another text widget here to show you so inside of this list of widgets you can hit enter here these commas are important if you get rid of the commas and you save uh, your formatting can get all out of whack so if I save here notice the formatting is a little off so it's, it's a good idea to have the trailing commas and if you do have like a list of widgets if you leave the trailing comma all you have to do is just hit enter and then add your other widget so here we're gonna get into the buttons so we have two different types of buttons we have elevated buttons and they're gonna have a parameter on pressed now this parameter on pressed as the documentation the documentation states is of type function so we have to define a function so if we go up here where this other function is created we'll go ahead and create another function button pressed this function is going to set the state and notice how it prefills a lot of these a lot of this stuff all you have to do so set you can do setf and it'll give you some other options or you can do setS set state and just hit tab so now that we've set the state like I said the set state and here's more phenomenal documentation it tells you exactly right there notifies the framework that internal uh, that the internal state of the object has changed so just go ahead and read read this make sure that you read it and we'll get into some of the online stuff a little later so we have to create another variable that we know that we want to display on screen so string message and actually and we're going to initialize the string message what we're going to do is inside of this message we're going to set it to message is equal to hello and we will add the counter as well to this times 10 So, actually, actually, I'm going to skip on that for now. You'll, I'll see a little later why I'm going to do that. So, we'll just set it to hello for now. And set a breakpoint there. we got to call this here function down here. So, in this on pressed, we're going to throw that in there. Button pressed. Now, don't do this. We're going to talk about parameterized functions later on with these, uh, when we attach them to events. But for now, don't do this. If it's a void function, you don't have to uh, add the, cur the uh, parentheses. The child of this elevated button will be a text widget. This text widget will have some strings. Will have a string saying message. So hit that. Notice that uh, we get to this point. Now remember, message is empty at this point because we initialize it to empty. We set the state. We set the message. I'm going to go ahead and continue. Notice how the text changes. So, uh, at the at the very very high level, this is really all that we're doing. Uh, now that sounds like it's an over it's an over simplification of the application development, but really we're just modifying elements on screen. So the modifications might be from an API call. They might be from user interaction which might fire off an API call and uh, other related items but we're just updating visual elements on screen so once you get used to doing that it becomes really easy so let me pull up my schedule here to make sure that I cover everything it's important so we've covered the elevated button now I'll cover the text button as well it's another important item that we should cover so I'm gonna add my trailing commas like I said for formatting and 
if you don't have this auto formatting stuff set up you can go and set it up I can't remember exa the exact option where to go up here to set it up but once we get into chat GPT I'll show you that it's really easy to do and actually here I'm gonna do the I'm gonna do the text button and then we can get into chat GPT and the documentation while working on the app as well so text button on pressed we can have button pressed here again whoops child of text widget it says hello I'm gonna go ahead and save and if we go and click here boom the meth the function is invoked so same deal it just doesn't have this outline flutter handles all these items like I said very uh, it, it makes it very simple if you wanted to do this in a native application there are classes so if you do this with Kotlin or with Java to write a native Android application there are button classes there are classes to display visual elements on screen so don't get me wrong it's not like it's super difficult or anything like that it's just that to make to really customize them and to do that kind of stuff it makes it's, it's a little bit more difficult uh, but the documentation is out there and if you really want to do it it's not it's not uh, impossible right but it, it's a little bit more difficult than it is with Flutter Flutter just out of the box has a lot of options basically. Step ahead of that and or step out of I mean. So Chat GPT, what's its uh what's its purpose? Why do we need to worry about Chat GPT? Well, at the end of the day, you as a developer, regardless of whether you want to use Chat GPT or not, or even any other resource, right? There might be something else that comes out in the future, but what it boils down to is you need to provide value for the company that you're working for or your own company that you're going to you know perhaps create or a nonprofit who whichever organization you work for you need to create you need to provide value ideally you would provide value and developers i mean you you can't you can't lie right i mean i personally loved working with computers i loved developing throughout like high school and my early years uh, but I can't say that I didn't think about the salary, right? So development pays, pays all right. Uh, and with that salary, with that money that you're going to make, you're trading your skills, your expertise, in this case with writing applications, with uh, fixing bugs, deploying applications, whatever you end up doing, you're going to have to create, you're going to have to provide some sort of value and you're going to be compensated for that. So what I like to always say is you need to provide more value than what an intern can provide with ChatGPT. Why should the company have to pay you, you know, X dollars a year when they can pay an intern with ChatGPT to produce the same code, if not higher quality code for X minus $10,000 per year. So that's really, that's how I like to relate it. So how can we actually use ChatGPT? We want to be very verbose. So first off, and it, it's not a requirement, of course, for the course. It's I just thought I'd bring it up because it's uh, it's getting very common in the workplace. Uh, I've had students tell me that they use it personally, and if you decide to use it, you know, might might as well make the most of it. Uh, it's not perfect, of course, and uh, you need to be aware of its limitations. So why don't we go ahead and start here? So you just go to the chat the chat GPT website create an account they require a phone number you can't use a voice over IP phone number once you go ahead and you create your account what you do is you basically ask it a very verbose question so let's say in this example how to set up auto format in Visual Studio Code uh, with Flutter So open VS Code settings by clicking on the gear icon on the bottom left corner or by doing control plus. Let's try that. Control plus. Oh. Okay, maybe that see and like I said it's not always perfect. <laughs> so that's one example where it's not exactly as you would um 
you don't expect it to be. Let's go ahead and open the settings though. So we can go and closest thing to that settings right here. Okay, and it looks like that keyboard shortcut was right on the dot, but we can go ahead and go back to here. The settings, search for format. and format on save. So that's one example where you could use it. Uh, let's see how verbose we can get with it. So let's ask ChatGPT, write a widget in Flutter. Uh, what do we want this widget to do with four buttons? One uh, spaced equally with length and width of, with a length and width of 30 pixels and each button will hitting each button will cause a pop-up a dialogue with a random number. So notice how it writes all of the necessary code right there. So if we look here, we have a size box. Here we have that, uh, that uh, explicit sizing. So the width and height of 30 pixels, a child of elevated button, and a, an anonymous function here that uh, basically creates a random number, random number between, uh, or the next random number up to 100. Let's see here, and looks like there is a method here, show dialog, takes in the context of the application, takes in a builder, or uh, assigns a builder, again with the context of the application. We'll get into the context and the, like the low level stuff with that later on in the semester, but at this point just know that it's uh, a global variable at least to the uh, class that you're working in and that it gets passed on between uh, classes in the Flutter application. Returns an alert dialog. This all looks pretty good so far and once that widget has been created that widget has to be called I'm guessing inside of a stateless widget material app and Right here, this four button widget. Now let's verify that it is four buttons. And here is four, so underscore uh, build button is the uh, widget that we create here. It takes in the context and looks like a row with four of these widgets spaced with uh, alignment of spaced evenly is created and it's returned. So four of these are created. So just based on this, the row is created from left to right, left, right, then goes down, left, right again. And if we look here, that gets called. Four button uh, widget, four button widget gets called inside of the main application. That uh, main dot dart. So this right, like this is this looks good, and I'm sure if I placed it in, it would be, it would probably run fine. So. This can really get you started on any of the stuff that you have to do. So, I mean, like I said, be very verbose with it. Uh, what I like to go to, so ChatGPT is a good tool. It works good for things like this. It doesn't always provide the most secure, the most uh, reliable code, the most bug-free code. That's on to you, the developer, to make those decisions. ChatGPT only takes in what you give it. So as a very, a very common concept in computer science and in this program as well, the computer programming program, is the concept of garbage in, garbage out. You provide a computer with garbage and it's, it's not going to be able to provide any meaningful output. So based on that, it's the exact same deal here. You pass in garbage, it's going to come out with garbage. So you have to know what, you have to know how to define each, each step. So you have to know that there's a widget, you have to know what a button is, how spacing works, what a pixel is, so on and so forth. Things that a intern probably knows, 
from a computer science program or computer programming program so just like I said keep those items in mind uh, but what I like to really reference is the Flutter documentation so this is the Flutter documentation it's docs.flutter.dev and you can go from the user interface and if you want to go into animations because ideally you would come in, you would come to the documentation when you have a UI related question or maybe even a logic related question so say you want to know how you navigate from one page to another Ooh, let's just go into the overview using the navigator so and we can look at this very basic here at a high level what the navigator is the navigator widget displays uh, screens as a stack. So think about it as like the programming concept or the computer science concept of the stack where elements can get popped or they can get added onto the stack. And or pushed I guess is the right terminology but pushed or popped. And notice that that terminology is used here. So this navigator which takes in the context push here, this push uh, method or function that is the part of the navigator basically what it does is it pushes something onto the screen so it pushes a new page onto it or a new widget so on and so forth depending on what you built but like I said the documentation has so many different uh, it, it just has so much just about any question you might want to ask and of course you can use chat GPT to ask it so if you go and say how to navigate between pages and flutter it'll tell you what you have to do it'll demonstrate the navigation somewhere right here so but notice this navigator dot push named uh, there was we don't recommend using named routes for most applications for more information, see the limitation section be below. So that is one example where you might you might not want to copy paste that uh, that logic that ChatGPT outputs because, as it states, it has limitations where they the behavior is always the same, can't be customized. Uh, it's just there's it's, there's just so many different items where ChatGPT falls short. But if you're familiar with the programming language, it can help. It can serve as, uh, I don't want to call it a crutch, but it can serve as an, an, an alternative source of documentation. With that being said, the other option is Stack Overflow. So if I create a new uh, tab here and I look up how to, I'm just trying to think of a good example, how to create the equivalent of a grid. in Flutter and Stack Overflow. So what I was thinking is the equivalent of a grid from Xamarin. So let's be a little bit more verbose. So it's not exactly notice this didn't provide the exact answer that I wanted. However, Stack Overflow is a good, it's a good resource. It sounds silly, right? It, wh why is this, why is this, why is this instructor going over how to Google stuff? Why is he going over how to use ChatGPT? And the reason is because, believe it or not, it can turn into an issue where people just go straight, and not, not, not in, not in terms of the uh, class, right? So, in this course, it's it's okay to ask questions to an extent, uh, but in the real world, once you're out there developing, if you're asking continuous questions every single day, uh, you got to remember that your coworkers, your manager, uh, your colleagues, so on and so forth, people that you're working with, they have stuff to do as well. So if you're continuously asking questions and you're not letting them get their work done because of that, that can be problematic in the workplace. So really, stuff as sim something as simple as taking what you would tell taking the question that you would ask your coworker and looking it up on Google or on Stack Overflow or even on Chat GPT that can it can save it can save your name to 
as funny as that sounds, it can make you more self-sufficient. And that's really a very desirable quality with developers, self-sufficiency, where you can go out and be assigned a task, uh, whatever it is, and whichever system that you your organization uses to organize uh, tasks and related work items. If you can go and take care of those items by yourself, that's very desirable. If you need to be co uh, continuously monitored to make sure that you're getting the work done or you always have questions. Uh, now design related stuff, of course, that uh, that's, under that's understandable to a certain extent. But uh, asking like, oh, well, how do I navigate between this and this? Like that's something that you should be able to go and look up on Google. And I'm not saying don't ask me how to uh, navigate, but be reasonable, right? First look it up on ChatGPT or Google or Stack Overflow, and uh, it'll get you it'll get you used to doing that on the workplace in the workplace. But look, it says right here to create a grid like layout, you can use the grid view. So this is an example where it does it is it's more useful. So the, I, I like to think of ChatGPT as like a refined uh, Google search where it gives you the right result more more often than not the first time. And if it doesn't, then you can modify your message and be a little bit ver more verbose. So for example, with that navigation question that I asked earlier, if I would have said, "Do not use this. Do not use the uh, named." named routes it would have created it without using name routes named routes so that's just an example of being very verbose for this week though this is just about it so at uh, just in conclusion here we went over what the general structure of the application is we touched on a couple concepts with uh, navigation. Not really, right? I was just showing off the documentation, but uh, the tooling that Flutter has. So you start typing, then you hit tab, and it'll give you the next result. So if you if you start typing theme data in the theme parameter, it's going to start automatically filling in all the information that you're going to need. If you want to create a function with a set state in it, you just go create the function my function and then just start typing there you go we also went over that uh, something that I should actually review though is in your set state all you have to do is just change your variables if you're gonna go and make an API call and make your changes then once the API call is made asynchronously then you go ahead and do that inside your set state and display the changes or what you're actually going to end up doing more than likely is you're going to you're going to go and make an API call and when that API call begins you're going to set some sort of so like you might have some sort of flag right so this isn't a good name right but it's just an example here so you might have a flag and this flag may be attached to a circular progress indicator so let's throw in a circular progress indicator here and let me sh let me show everybody here a pretty neat trick if we right click and we select refactor and we refactor with let's just wrap it with a widget and this widget is a circular progress indicator and notice that that's not a parameter of it so can't remember what exactly it's attached to but once again we can just go to the documentation it's a perfect example here so we just look it up circular progress indicator Look it up here. There we go. Circular progress indicator and let's find the example here. So we can just add it. 
inside of the text box. The reason I wanted to throw stuff inside of it is to get rid of everything, but you can do that another way. Uh, once we get into the ternary operator and how to do logic inside of the uh, UI layer, it'll be more evident, but we're not going to cover that quite yet. So we just get rid of all this stuff that I threw in here. And then at the end we can get rid of, or not get rid, but we can add the circular progress indicator. We're not going to have a controller.value because we don't have this controller variable defined anywhere. So we're just going to do flag. Oh. And let's make sure that this takes in we got to see what it takes in here. So the value Let's try a value of 10 here. So you can control how far, how much progress there is. Uh, the way that I would have set it up is I would have set it up to go and just indicate that the progress, that this was in progress, so that the API call, once the API call is being made, we set it so that it's in progress, display that to the user. Once the API call is completed, we demonstrate that it's no longer in progress by hiding it. So actually that's probably not even the, probably not even how we want to handle that. We just do this there we go so that's uh, if it's in progress and with the ternary operator which I'm not going to demonstrate quite yet we can remove this from the screen by having a condition here basically using the ternary operator and once that condition is met we display it once the uh, condition is not met we go and display something else or we just display nothing so that's just one example but uh, like I said, the documentation, the uh, chat GPT, kind of the basics of state and uh, setting the state in the application, modifying variables, attaching variables and functions to the, uh, the clicked events or the pressed events of buttons here. That's uh, the basics of what we covered here. So if you have any questions, go ahead and let me know. Uh, via Discord preferably, but other than that, thank you for watching.